Okay, well, it is 3.30 Central Time, so I believe we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Back to Basics and Beyond webinar series. Today's webinar is on how to take a blood pressure. Um, for those of you who have joined us before, we're really glad to have you back. And if this is the first time joining this webinar series, we're glad to have you. This webinar series, Back to Baseline and Beyond Post-COVID Management of Patients with Chronic Conditions, is focused on helping care providers across the continuum of care use lessons learned from the pandemic to improve chronic disease management and outcomes. So before we get started, could you please take a minute to enter your name and organization or facility and your role in chat so everyone can know who has joined us today? And while you are entering your information into chat, I just wanted to um, share with you that I'm Carrie Finley and I'm with the Superior Health Quality Alliance Chronic Disease Management Team. And I'll be your facilitator today. And I'm also joined by Andrea Boucher, who will be presenting. All right. Thank you, Carrie. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. As Carrie said, my name is Andrea Boucher. I'm excited to have you all with us this afternoon. Um, so our objectives for our session for today will be to go over the techniques required for accurate blood pressure measurement. We'll go over how you can strengthen your blood pressure measuring techniques for yourself and your staff. Um, we will review blood pressure thresholds and then also share some hypertension management strategies and resources. So before we get started today, um, we do want to make this session as interactive as possible. So if you have a pen and paper handy or some way to write uh, this down, we do want to play a scavenger hunt game with you this afternoon. So um, we'll give you some clues throughout. So I'll be asking you to notice some things about yourself and your environment, and I'll tell you how you can score those appropriately. So keep tabs of your points throughout this presentation, and we'll tally up our numbers at the end um, and see how you do. So just like golf, the lower the score, the better. So to kick it off, we have our first scavenger hunt item. So we would like to know, are your feet on the ground and your ankles uncrossed? So if you're someone like me who likes to sit Indian style, which is not very ergonomic in your chair, um, feel free to um, give yourself 10 points for item number one. So feel free to jot that down. All right, so before we dive into proper blood pressure uh, measurement technique, I wanna take a moment just to talk about really the why of um, the importance of proper blood pressure measurement. So we're going to look at some blood pressure facts really quick. So one in three Americans has high blood pressure or hypertension, and it is more common among some population groups, including African-Americans and adults who are over the age of 60. High blood pressure is also commonly known as the silent killer, uh, really because most people don't show any symptoms that they have high blood pressure. There is also this connection with chronic conditions. More than 65% of adults who have diabetes also have high blood pressure. More than 20% of people who are 20 years and older who have chronic kidney disease have high blood pressure and 74% of people with chronic heart failure have high blood pressure. So there is that chronic uh, condition connection and patients who have diabetes and are not diagnosed with hypertension are definitely at a higher risk um, for developing hypertension. And this slide highlights some of those consequences of high blood pressure on the body, especially if it's left untreated. Um, so I'll just go down the list here. Um, stroke, um, high blood pressure can cause the vessels in the brain to either burst or to clog. High blood pressure can also lead to vision loss um, due to the strain um, on the vessels and the eyes. It can also lead to heart failure. Um, high blood pressure causes the heart to enlarge and then in turn fail to supply blood to the rest of the body. It can also cause heart attacks um, and damage arteries and can cause blockages. It can lead to kidney disease or uh, damage to the arteries around the kidneys and also sexual dysfunction in both men and women. So really blood pressure checks are that first step um, in identifying patients with high blood pressure to avoid these potentially deadly consequences down the road. So why is it important to screen patients for high blood pressure? It's really important to identify these patients, um, especially those who have uncontrolled high blood pressure 
Uh, there could be patients who might not be aware that they have high blood pressure. Again, um, I mentioned that high blood pressure doesn't always present with symptoms. Or there could be patients who are aware that they have high blood pressure, but maybe they're not managing it and they're not controlling their blood pressure. And it, the other benefits are to also prevent complications and to improve outcomes when patients are routinely screened um, as recommended by their provider. All right, time for scavenger hunt item number two. Are your legs uncrossed? So if you do have crossed legs, you can give yourself six and a half points for item number two. All right, so we can't diagnose or treat patients high blood pressure correctly if we're not capturing that correctly through um, proper measurement. So making sure that we're taking patients blood pressure correctly on every patient every time is really essential. And having those accurate measurements really leads to, you know, correct diagnosis. Um, that blood pressure is used, those readings are used to initiate treatment, uh, monitor the effects of drug therapy, can also lead to timely and effective treatment routine monitoring of patient's blood pressure and also medication adherence. So if you are measuring a patient's blood pressure and maybe you have a missed elevated, or in other words, you underestimated the reading, that could be interpreted as a false normal level and could lead to under treatment, which could lead to more organ damage for that patient. On the other side, if you overestimated or have a false high reading, that could lead to overtreatment and could be the possibility of drug-induced side, side effects for that patient. So that's why, like I said, it's very important to use proper techniques so that your readings are really consistent and reliable. So this slide shows a couple of different things that impact a patient's blood pressure. And we have these divided up into patient factors, which we cannot always control, and then measurement factors, which we can control. And really the bulk of what we're going to be focusing on today are those measurement factors, but just wanna cover these patient factors really quickly. Um, the first is white coat hypertension. So you may have instances where patients have elevated blood pressure in the medical setting as opposed to at home. This could be due to kind of that, that next bullet in here, the nervousness, stress, um, any kind of um, you know, negative emotions they might be feeling could be causing that white coat hypertension. Also, if the patient is sick, if they are um, in pain, or maybe they have, for example, a long waiting time, um, that could also elevate their blood pressure. Certain demographics for patients um, also have an impact on their blood pressure based on their age, their sex, race, and ethnicity. Also, uh, lifestyle. If a patient has poor diet or exercise habits, if they are using substances such as uh, smoking or alcohol use, um, those can also impact their blood pressure, which is why lifestyle modifications are usually some of the first um, recommendations in managing blood pressure. And also recent uh, caffeine or over-the-counter uh, decongestants um, or nicotine use can have um, a short-term effect on a patient's blood pressure. And also talking during the measurement. So if a patient is, is talking, that can cause it to be elevated. So what are those measurement factors, those things that we can control um, as we are measuring a patient's blood pressure? Um, patient positioning, this is a really big one um, and one that I will uh, spend a little bit of time on in a little bit. Um, air in the blood pressure cuff before measuring. You want to make sure that the blood pressure cuff is fully deflated before putting it on the patient's arms and that you're not getting a falsely high reading. You also want to make sure you're choosing the correct cuff size. If you're choosing one that's too large, that could underestimate the patient's blood pressure. And on the flip side, if you're choosing one that's too small, that could overestimate the patient's blood pressure. And as you are um, wrapping the blood pressure cuff on the patient's arm, you want to make sure that it's wrapped evenly so that it doesn't you know, come undone um, upon inflation. You also want to make sure you're deflating the cuff at a slow enough uh, pace so that you can see where the correct systolic and diastolic readings are. So that's going to be mostly during the, the manual method of blood pressure measurement. Same thing with not inflating the cuff high enough or too high. So this can be very individualized per patient. And we'll talk about how you can do that um, using the maximum inflation level technique. And then the auscultatory gap. So this is when the pulse disappears and then it reappears while you're deflating the cuff. So you wanna make sure you're interpreting that gap um, correctly because if you're interpreting it 
um, incorrectly, it could lead to um, blood pressure monitoring errors. So either an underestimation of the systolic blood pressure or an overestimation of the diastolic blood pressure. And then also looking at the gauge at an angle. So again, this is with the manual method. You want to make sure that you're looking at your stigma manometer um, directly on so that you're not seeing any glares or you're, you're seeing um, where those systolic and diastolic values are. So this next slide covers the blood pressure level thresholds. These are the most recent recommendations from the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology. Um, so it categorizes blood pressures into normal elevated and then going into the um, hypertensive categories. So normal blood pressure is considered a systolic of less than 120 and a diastolic of less than 80. Elevated is considered systolic between 120 to 129 and a diastolic of less than 80. And then getting into stage one hypertension is systolic between 130 to 139 or a diastolic between 80 to 89. Stage two hypertension is systolic of 140 or higher or a diastolic of 90 or higher. And then a patient would be in a hypertensive crisis if they had a systolic reading higher than 180 and or a diastolic of higher than 120. So I have a quick pop quiz for you here so you can feel free to answer your, uh, put your answer in the chat box, uh, but don't worry, this is not graded. Um, so does an elevated systolic or diastolic value put individuals at greater risk for complication? So feel free to, you can private message me in the chat, you can put it, you know, so everyone can see in the chat, but feel free to jot your answer down um, in the chat box. And I'm seeing a couple of answers come in and that's great. And you are both correct for what I see so far, it is diastolic. So a high diastolic blood pressure does indicate a greater risk for complications, especially for those um, that are over the age of 55. So great job everyone for getting that one correct. All right, our next scavenger hunt item is, is your back supported? So if you are seated, but your back is not supported, go ahead and give yourself five points for item number three. All right, so now that we know the why on the importance of accurate blood pressure measurements, we're going to walk through what equipment you're going to need to be able to do this. So at your facility, you could have different types of blood pressure equipment. So I'm gonna cover each of those and how you can use those to get your accurate blood pressure readings. So there are a couple of options for equipment that can be used to measure a patient's blood pressure. Um, in general, the gold standard is um, going to be devices with upper arm cuffs. So here we have summarized manual, semi-automated, and automated devices. So the top two on this slide show two manual devices, one that is portable and then one that is mounted to the wall, which is typically seen in an outpatient exam room. Um, these devices, you will be inflating the cuff yourself um, using the inflation pump and using a stethoscope to listen for Krokoff sounds that are associated with the systolic and diastolic values. The automated and the semi-automated devices are um, the two on the bottom. They're very easy to use, um, reduce the chances for human error. With the semi-automatic device, um, there is the option to inflate the cuff manually by hand using the bulb like your manual device. Um, once it's inflated, you can then um, start deflating the cuff automatically. Beyond that point, the reading is going to be produced similar to the fully automatic device. And that fully automatic um, device, those are going to have the electric pump for inflating the cuff. The operation of that is obviously very easy to use, requires minimum input um, from the user. Once the cuff is placed on the upper arm, the device can be switched on and then the readings are going to be produced automatically. So using a um, fully automated device could help um, reduce the possibility of white coat hypertension. Um, a clinician could you know, set a patient up to have multiple readings measured and leave the room while those measurements are being taken. Um, it is important to make sure that these devices are validated for clinical accuracy and also that they're calibrated um, periodically. So this means having those devices tested to see if they are producing accurate readings. So it's recommended for manual devices to be calibrated every six months. Um, one quick way to be able to tell if a manual device is not calibrated is if the dial on the gauge is not resting at zero when the cuff is fully deflated. 
And then the automated and semi-automated devices should be calibrated on an annual basis. So I would recommend to reference your device manual for those if you do have those types of devices um, to see if you're able to calibrate those yourselves or if you need to contact the manufacturer. So we've talked a little bit about the types of devices. So next we'll go through like knowing the components that make up a blood pressure device. So what you'll need is a blood pressure cuff. Um, for manual devices, this is going to include the inflation system, which is the cuff, the inflatable bladder inside of the cuff, the inflation pump and the pressure control valve. Um, it'll also have a calibrated spigma manometer gauge. If you do have a defective spigma manometer gauge, this could lead to inaccuracy. Again, you want to make sure your device is calibrated before you are taking any measurements. You also want to have the option to have a few different cuff sizes so that you can um, fit your patients properly, whether that's a pediatric, small, um, ranging up to the size of a, a larger, extra larger thigh cuff as well. And then also you would need a stethoscope if you're using the manual method. All right, scavenger hunt item number four, are your arms supported at heart level? If you have one or both of your arms not supported at heart level, you can go ahead and give yourself 10 points for item number four. All right, so accurate readings are really, like I've been trying to, to hit home on, the basis for identifying and managing patients with high blood pressure. So what we're going to do next is walk through the recommended steps for measuring blood pressure to make sure that your care team is using con a consistent technique to get the most accurate readings possible. So we've broken these up into 10 simple steps. Um, this does depend on the type of device you're using. So if you do have automated or semi-automated devices in your facility, there are going to probably be less steps involved um, in your process. So our first step is to choose the right equipment. So again, going through what you're going to need is a quality stethoscope if you're using the manual device. Um, and then no matter what device you're using, you're going to need an appropriately sized blood pressure cuff for that patient. And I'll go over how you can kind of measure how it's going to be a good fit in a second. And then a blood pressure measurement device. Step number two is to prepare the patient. So this piece is really, really important regardless of what type of device you're using. Before you're measuring, you want to allow the patient some time at rest. So five minutes is typically what's recommended. This is to be sure that if the patient maybe just walked in from the lobby, um, it, it gives them time for their blood pressure to return to normal. So you want to make sure you're having the patient seated um, to prepare them for their blood pressure to be taken. You want to use the correct cuff size. So I'm going to go through each of these um, bubbles on this infographic here. So use the correct cuff size. If you use a cuff that's too small, this could potentially add between two and 10 millimeters of mercury to your patient's reading. You want to place the cuff on the patient's bare arm. If it's placed over clothing, that could add anywhere from five to 50 millimeters of mercury. It can also make it really difficult to hear the pulse sounds if you're using the manual method. So if you do have a patient who is rolling up their sleeve, if they're not able to fully remove their arm from their sleeve, you want to make sure that it's not being too restrictive and that you can place at least two fingers widths into the sleeve of their clothing to make sure it's not um, being restrictive. You also want to support the patient's arm at heart level. If it's unsupported, that could add 10 millimeters of mercury. So oftentimes um, these patient positioning factors are going to depend on the setup of your exam room or wherever you are measuring the patient's blood pressure. So it is recommended to seat a patient in a chair. So if you do have that available, definitely recommend doing that. If not, try to at least cover as many of these pieces as you can. Um, if you have a chair, um, if one has an armrest, that way the patient's arm can be resting on either the armrest or if you have a, a table with like a countertop next to it, um, that's an option too to support the patient's arm. You could also use your waist uh, to support the patient's arm. Just make sure that um, the patient's not really supporting their own weight of their arm. You also want to make sure that the patient is seated with their legs and their ankles uncrossed. Um, crossed legs could add two to eight millimeters of mercury. Um, and while the patient's seated, you want to make sure that they're not, you know, seated forward in a chair, making sure that their uh, back is supported. An unsupported back and unsupported feet could add six millimeters of mercury. 
And also make sure that the patient has an empty bladder. If um, you're in an outpatient setting and maybe the patient needs a urinalysis or even just needs to use the restroom before their blood pressure needs to be measured, try to do this first. A full bladder could add 10 millimeters of mercury to their reading. And then also make sure there are no conversations going on in the room. If the patient is talking or even if they're actively listening, this could add 10 millimeters of mercury. So these patient positioning techniques should help you get um, the most accurate blood pressure reading. Uh, like I said, whether you're using either the automated or a manual method. All right, step number three is to choose the proper blood pressure cuff size. So I had mentioned a few slides back, if you choose a cuff that's too large, it's gonna underestimate the blood pressure and too small will overestimate. So you wanna make sure you're choosing the right size. Um, if you're looking at a blood pressure cuff, typically there is an index line that runs along the width or the, the shorter side of the cuff. As you're wrapping the cuff around the patient's arm, you wanna make sure that that index line is falling within the range. And the range is usually typically on the top or the longer side of the cuff. So that lets you know if the cuff size is going to be appropriate for that patient. If the cuff is um, falling on the inside of the range or the index is on the inside of the range, you know it's going to be too big. And if it's on the outside of the range, you know that that cuff is going to be too small. And then this slide is just for your reference. Um, I don't anticipate you going around with a tape measure and measuring patients' arms, but it's really just about cuff dimensions by arm size. And just a note to say that if you do notice that um, an extra large cuff is still too small on a patient, you can use an adult by cuff um, on the upper arm if you do have one available. All right, scavenger hunt item number five, are you dressed in layers? If you are wearing layers that cannot be removed from one or both arms, you can give yourself 27 and a half points for item number five. All right, step number four is to place the blood pressure cuff on the patient's arm. So how you do this is you want to palpate the brachial artery at the crease of the patient's arm and position the blood pressure cuff so that the artery marker that is on the cuff is pointing down towards the brachial artery. So once you've located that position, you're going to wrap the blood pressure cuff snugly around the patient's arm. And I have a couple of two finger rules here. Um, I've already mentioned uh, another one before, but our other two finger rules are um, to have two finger widths above the crease of the arm so that you have enough space to place your stethoscope if you are using the manual technique. And then for either manual or automatic um, to do a two fingers uh, slip at the top of the patient's, uh, top of the cuff on the patient's arm so that you can see that the cuff is wrapped snugly enough, but not too tight that it's going to be too restrictive. All right, so I have another pop quiz question for you all. And feel free, like I said, to add this in chat. You can private message me or you can send it to the full group. So which arm should be used to measure a blood pressure? So put your best guess for what you think that might be um, in the chat box. Give it just a minute for some additional answers to come in. I've seen the dominant arm, probably the left, see the right. So kind of a little bit of both here. All right, so the answer to this is actually um, per patient. So as you're checking a patient's blood pressure at their first visit, you want to check the blood pressure in both of their arms. So at subsequent visits, you would then use the arm that had the higher blood pressure um, at that time. So almost a trick question. <laughs> All right, step number five is position the stethoscope. So on the same arm that you place the blood pressure cuff, you're going to, again, palpate the brachial pulse at the crease of the arm, and then you would place the diaphragm of the stethoscope over the brachial artery at that location. And then step number six is that maximum inflation level that I mentioned. So this is also called the auscultatory palpatory technique. 
Um, so it's really about how you inflate the cuff. Um, this is really only for the manual technique so that you're not just inflating all patients up to the same number, let's just say 200. It's really going to be per patient. So if a patient typically has a lower systolic value, they don't necessarily need to be inflated that high um, and, and not inflating them that high could actually make them feel a little bit more comfortable as they have their blood pressure taken. On the flip side, if a patient has a systolic value higher than 200, um, if you're only inflating up to 100, you're not going to be able to accurately capture that. So for the first option is to inflate the cuff as you listen to the brachial pulse. So here with this step, you're going to have the cuff on the patient's arm. The stethoscope is located over the patient's brachial artery that you've already located. You're going to slowly inflate the cuff until you hear those pulse sounds disappear through the stethoscope. So you're going to look at the gauge, note that number where you heard those pulse sounds disappear, and then you would inflate 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury above that level. So then um, you can measure from there. You would deflate and take your reading. The second option, you would not need to use your stethoscope for. So you would still have the um, cuff on the patient's arm. You would inflate the cuff, but on this one, you're going to be palpating the radial pulse at the patient's wrist. So as you're inflating the cuff, you want to feel for that radial pulse to disappear. Again, note that gauge reading and then inflate the cuff an additional 20 to 30 millimeters above that level. Again, this is just so it's done on a patient by patient basis so that we're not just blanket inflating up to a certain level and capturing these readings um, accurately. All right, scavenger hunt item number six, are you talking? If you're having a conversation, or um, I would say even if you're actively listening, which I hope that you all are, uh, give yourself six points for item number six. All right, so step number seven. So you um, have already inflated the cuff, you, your, your patient's ready for their blood pressure to be taken, you're deflating. So you want to make sure that if you're using um, the manual method that you're doing this very slowly. Um, so with the manual technique, um, you want to make sure the pressure falls at about two to three millimeters of mercury per second. This sounds really, really slow, but it's just to make sure that you're noticing the crock off sounds at the correct levels. Um, if you're using automated or semi-automated, this is going to be done automatically for you after you press the start button on the device. And then step number eight is to listen for the systolic reading. So this is going to be that first occurrence of pulse sounds that you hear as blood begins to flow through the artery in the patient's, is the patient's systolic blood pressure. So that's that top number and it's representative of the um, blood vessels when your heart beats. Step number nine is to then continue to listen as the blood pressure cuff uh, pressure drops, that diastolic reading is when the last pulse sounds are heard before all sounds disappear. So that's that bottom number, and it's representative of um, the pressure in the vessels when the heart rests between beats. So step number 10 is our last step to double check for accuracy. So if a patient has a blood pressure over 120, over 80, it is recommended to take a confirmatory measurement just to make sure that that patient's blood pressure is in fact elevated. Um, so if um, you want to note the individual readings, you can take an average to give you a snapshot. Some of the automated devices will do that for you automatically. Um, but if you are taking more than one measurement, you want to make sure that you are waiting one to two minutes in between readings to make sure you're bringing that patient down to that rest, that baseline um, to bring their blood pressure back down. And scavenger hunt item number seven is a part of the inquiry, but do you need to use the restroom? If you have a full bladder, go ahead and give yourself 10 points for item number seven. So next we'll go over some hypertension management strategies and resources. So a little bit of a background on diagnosing hypertension. This must be done based on multiple elevated readings. So you can look back in the patient's medical history to see if they've had multiple elevated readings from previous visits, or if this is their first elevated reading, you wanna make sure that you are following up with the patient in one to four weeks to confirm the diagnosis of hypertension. So this slide um, highlights a 
uh, blood pressure protocol. This is really a best practice for identifying, treating, and managing hypertension, making sure that this is a clinic-wide protocol to make sure that all clinicians in your facility are diagnosing and treating hypertension in a standardized way. Um, so this tool is from the American Heart Association and the American Medical Association. Uh, it's something that your team could refer to for the treatment protocol. It's a really useful tool. You're able to um, click on each of the hypertension thresholds, and it really guides you through what the recommended actions or next steps are, when to reassess a patient um, and remeasure their blood pressure, and during reassessment, what those next steps are, if their goal is met or if their goal was not met. So there is a link to this tool on this slide, which we will provide you the slides as well. And we have a couple of bonus items for our scavenger hunt uh, today. So have you had caffeine in the last half hour? If you have consumed a caffeine product in the last 30 minutes, you can give yourself five points for bonus item number one. In a resource that we find really helpful um, in making sure that your team is measuring blood pressure correctly is a competency checklist. So this could be used to observe your staff's technique as they're measuring blood pressure. You can do this either in what I would say is like a classroom setting, or you can um, observe them taking patients' blood pressures. So how this is broken up is to include all of the steps that you require for measuring a patient's blood pressure, everything we've talked about today, and really divide it into two columns as you're assessing um, your staff's competency, if it was performed or if it was not performed. Um, and it, it's really helpful um, in identifying those steps that apply based on what type of blood pressure measurement device you are using in your facility. In many cases, I know a lot of facilities have both manual and automated. So it's really important to um, note what type of device is being used during uh, the competency check. And this is uh, an example of a competency checklist. It's from the Target BP program. Uh, and it's it breaks down pretty much everything that we covered today and allows you to quickly check off whether each of those pieces were completed as your staff is measuring blood pressure. All right, bonus item number two. Have you smoked in the last half hour? If you have smoked a tobacco product within the last 30 minutes, you can go ahead and give yourself five points for bonus item number two. And then going right into bonus item number three, were you just doing moderate or high level physical activity? If you were physically active immediately before this, go ahead and give yourself five points for bonus item number three. And with that, it's going to be time to add up your scores. So hopefully you have written them all down throughout the session today. Go ahead and add up your points for all of the scavenger hunt item and the bonus items included, and we'll talk through your total score. Um, and as you're tallying those, all, those up, feel free to um, add them in chat if you'd like, and we can see where, where everyone ended up. Um, but just to go through what those numbers mean, um, if you had done all of these pieces during a blood pressure measurement. Um, this is kind of representative of how your blood pressure could have been affected. So if you did not have your feet supported, it could have elevated your blood pressure about five to 10 millimeters of mercury. If your legs were crossed, could elevate anywhere from two to eight. If you had an unsupported back, could um, elevate it by five to 10. An unsupported arm could be uh, elevated by 10 millimeters of mercury. If you could not remove your arm from your sleeve and if the cuff was placed over clothing, could elevate it from 10 to 40 millimeters of mercury. If you were talking um, anywhere from 10 to 15, have a full bladder, again, anywhere from 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury. And then those bonus items, uh, consumed caffeine, um, smoking within 30 minutes, doing physical activity, these are, are more um, kind of immediate impacts on blood pressure, so could falsely elevate blood pressure for a short period of time. So given all of that, um, go ahead and look at your total score. And if you were having your blood pressure measured today with all of that, all of those components kind of taken into consideration and those issues were not addressed by the person who was measuring your blood pressure. Think about how that could have impacted um, what your, your reading could have been. Um, and I see a couple of you definitely had some 
Uh, I see your scores definitely had some things that you would have had to have had addressed um, with your blood pressure if you were being measured. So thanks for adding those in chat. Thanks for uh, keeping this interactive, everybody. All right. So with that, I'm going to pause and I will go ahead and open it up. If anyone has any questions, feel free to either unmute and ask your question or um, you can feel free to add questions in the chat box. And as we're waiting, I see that Jerry just put the link for the slides for today's session in the chat box. So if you did want to access those, the link is available to you there. Um, and I see Shayna cannot unmute. Um, do you want to add your question or your comment in the chat? All right, I just changed that setting. Thank you to Shayna. <laughs> I was like, well, clearly, I Clearly, you guys don't want me to talk. No, I'm just teasing. Um, I thought this was great. We have um, done a lot of focus at OMC to do blood pressure. Um, they've done separate trainings for you know the nursing staff to do blood pressure and then for submission for Minnesota Community Measure. Um, they've allowed um, outside and home blood pressures, which has been helpful for those patients that have the quote, white coat, um, their blood pressure is fine at home. So it just kind of helps providers look at an average. So I think this was great. Great, thank you, Shana. Yeah, I know we've had some resources too um, related to the self-measured blood pressure because that's definitely, there's been a, a big push for that to get that representation of what a patient's blood pressure is at home. So yeah, I appreciate your comment. And um, yeah, I know we have some resources on that um, as well available. I think Shana kind of got into um, a little bit of our discussion question for today. So, um, Carrie, I'm kind of stealing your thunder. I just transitioned into it here, but well, we can open it up for, for discussion if there's no additional questions. But curious to hear from you all um, if you test your staff's competency for blood pressure measurement. Um, maybe how frequently do you do that? And are there any specific tools that you use? So feel free to to unmute and share what your organization is doing or add it in the chat. Is there anyone that's not testing your staff's competency for blood pressure that maybe after today is considering doing that? Shana, feel free to unmute again. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm talking too much sometimes. Okay. <clears throat> no, I think um, the training material that we are giving to patients to help them is also helping our staff. Because there's actual like, kind of like the picture that you had um, for, you know, making sure your legs are uncrossed as just a reminder for the patients and then staff. I, I was in clinic probably uh, 10 years ago um, as a medical assistant. And the first thing I always did was like, just chatted them up a little bit and then just pretended to work or, you know, like it was before we had a different, was when we had a different EMR, but kind of did my little workflow as they just kind of sat there and relaxed. But um, the biggest thing is just like making sure the patients are sitting for a couple minutes before you start delving into a blood pressure or just take it at the end of the visit, you know, like do your whole thing and then, you know, reconcile everything, let them take a little breather and then do their blood pressure. But asking the patient to like, hey, do you have a high blood pressure even before you start? It's kind of an opening thing. I mean, you see it in front of their chart too, but what does the patient think their blood pressure is too has helped um, when I was on my side of things. Now I actually like build the hypertension registry. So it's completely different on my side. <laughs> 
No, those are all great points. Thank you so much for sharing. And I think those visual cues are, are really helpful for, like you said, both the staff and patient. Sometimes I, I've seen uh, clinics put that infographic as a visual reminder in exam rooms to make sure that all of those components are, are taken care of as they're measuring patients' blood pressure. So definitely great point. Thank you, Shana. I do have, I'm sorry, I do have a quick question on um, deciding kind of how high to pump the blood pressure cuffs. I know I was trained you know, a long time ago, but um, they basically taught us to another way to do it was to kind of find out what their average is and go 20 to 30 millimeters mercury above that. Is that still an appropriate kind of way to do it, even though you're not doing the pulse? Yes, that is an option. You could um, look back at the patient's uh, medical history to see, like you said, on average, what their blood pressure readings run typically. Um, and then you would go about, I would recommend going 30 millimeters of mercury above what that average normally is. And if you have any you know, questions, if you're kind of questioning that reading, if you don't think you inflated high enough to then you know, wait a couple of minutes and then reassess. But good question. I see some things going on in chat, so that's great. All right, all right, if there's no additional questions or comments, I will go ahead and turn it back over to Carrie. Okay, great, thanks, Andrea. Um, we just wanted to share with you some other um, features that we have available. Um, what we'd really like to do is to continue the conversation, and we have a tool called Superior Health Connect, um, and this is a tool that is a shared learning environment for Superior Health participants, um, essentially to come together to foster and promote an all teach all learn climate. And um, as you can see, we have the link here in order to access Superior Health Connect, and it'll be in the slide deck that you received as well. And um, it's pretty simple to sign up for it. I believe you just need to set up a username and password. And um, what it'll get you is not only um, an opportunity to post questions and have interactive conversations, but we do have additional blood pressure tools um, posted on that site. So um, we would love for you to um, continue the conversation with us um, using that feature. And then we wanted to share with you what's next. Um, as we said, um, today's webinar was a part of a webinar series. And um, our webinars are on the third Tuesday of each month and um, occur both at um, 12 o'clock Central and 3.30 p.m. Central Time. Um, so next month, we are our webinar is going to be on remote patient monitoring. It's not just telehealth anymore. So we're really looking forward to that one. Um, and then followed by um, a webinar in October um, in regards to integrating, excuse me, in November, integrating community health workers in your care flow. And um, we'll be doing a webinar in December on cardiac rehab. And January will be on diabetes. And then February, we will be hosting a webinar on motivational interviewing. And this one is a result of um, feedback and suggestions from participants on our past webinars um, that expressed a need to learn more about motivational interviewing. So um, if you have any recommendations for future topics, um, and you can think of them right now, please, by all means, um, post them in chat or um, definitely reach out to us um, after this um, session and let us know um, what topics you would be interested in. So for next steps, um, what we would love for you to do is go ahead and register for that October 18th webinar. Um, and we do have the links to the registration um, in the slide and I'll see if I can get them to um, go through and chat as well. Um, and then please, by all means, sign up for Superior Health Connect. 
Um, if you'd like to continue the conversation individually, we'd love to have you sign up for one-to-one -one calls. And we do have um, Jerry Hinkler's contact information um, there for those one-to-one -one calls. Um, we do have representatives in um, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan, and Jerry can kind of help make those connections um, to someone in your state. Um, and again, at any time, please feel free to reach out uh, with questions. So at this time, um, that does conclude the webinar. I just want to make sure um, Jerry is going to, is she, I didn't see it, if she posted the evaluation. Um, there it is. It is in chat because we would love your feedback. Um, so please, by all means, um, complete that evaluation. It's just a real simple, I think there's three questions and then there is the opportunity to add um, any additional comments or recommendations for future webinars. Um, so at this time, if there aren't any additional questions, um, that would conclude um, today's uh, webinar um, session for today. So thank you very much, and um, everyone can enjoy their afternoon.